welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about Zadok Knapp Judd, which in his patriarchal blessing given by Joseph Smith Sr. was identified as one of the 144,000. And um, we're going to read a little bit of that account. Um, this is from a thesis um, by <clears throat> Daryl Wesley Judd. Okay. Uh, it's really interesting. And we're going to go over more than just that. We're going to be talking about uh, more about symbolism, symbolism found in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to be using BYU resources uh, for that. And, um, you know, and we're also going to be talking a little bit about how the church itself, not just at an individual level, but the church itself progresses and learns line upon line, precept upon precept. So, let me just show you a few things. Now, this actually started uh, with something else. <clears throat> so I had this comment from JD. It says, the BYU New Testament commentary book on the book of Revelation has many insights. And so I went to go look for that, and it's here. I might end up buying it. I don't know. It's 1069. This is not a promotion. I'm not promoting the book. Um, I'm just responding in, uh, to that comment. And uh, I'll tell you what, I, I do really want to read through this because it looks like it's really informative. There's a preview uh, on here. This is Kobo.com. Um, there's a preview where it lets you uh, look at, you know, the first part of the book, first several pages, whatever. And it's really good. It's really good. Um, in fact, I'm going to read some of it here. Um, but before I do... Essentially what happened is this kind of led me on um, a search for other things that uh, I wouldn't have to buy from BYU. I don't exactly have the money right now to be spending on stuff like this, have some other priorities. Um, so that led me to here, and I think I've actually seen different articles from this website. This is uh, BYU Scholars Archive, and you can do searches right here, and there's a lot of good um, works. That you can research, and I found that's where I found this one: uh, Zadok Knapp Judd, soldier, colonizer, missionary to the Lamanites. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to do is just read the account uh, and then go from there. So uh, first, I just want to read about who he is. Uh, this thesis is a biography of Zadok Knapp Judd, Senior member of the famed Mormon battalion, soldier in the Provo War, colonizer and missionary of Southern Utah, and mechanic in the Cottonwood Mission, or sorry, Cotton Mission. Uh, the overall purpose of this writing is to show the relationship of Zadok Knapp Judd to these important movements in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, um, now that is an honor, being in the Mormon bata battalion. I would, that's, it's really cool because that was an actual U.S. Army unit, the only one in it, of its type in the history of the U.S. military where there's like a religious military unit. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I actually, on my spreadsheet, I actually looked this up, Mormon Battalion, because I was wondering if somehow this inspired um, the concept of the Lord's Youth Battalion, if that's like where the imagery, imagery was kind of drawn from when the when President Nelson introduced the concept of the Lord's Youth Battalion, but that'll be a video for another day. Uh, so let's go down to the part where it's talking about his patriarchal blessing. Um, I'm going to start from up here. Uh, difficult as it was for Zadok's mother to provide food for her family, she never forgot about their spiritual welfare. To help pr promote their religious growth, she took Zadok and the other boys to the patriarch, Joseph Smith Sr., and each received a blessing. Because of their poor financial condition, they did not pay for the blessing to be recorded, and the boys never received copies of them. It was important. It was an important experience for them, however, and 12-year-old Zadok remembered the occasion and some of the promises throughout his life. He said, He told me my name was recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, and angels had charge uh, to watch over me continually, and that I was one of the 144,000 that should stand as saviors upon Mount Zion in the latter days. Okay, so this is a very interesting account 
of course, we're just relying on his word and his memory, but I don't personally, um, you know, uh, question this. I, I think that he's probably telling the truth. Um, so this is interesting, but, you know, you should probably take it with a grain of salt. But there is other evidence that would suggest that this kind of language was being used at that time, not just with him, but with others. And I'm going to show you that. I've already actually covered it on the channel in another, in another video, but we're going to go over it again. The concept that the quote-unquote selection of the 144,000 started back in those days, early on in the church. Now, before we get to that, and we read those quotes and stuff like that, um, I first want to go, let's see, what, how are we going to do this? First, we're going to start with uh, this preview of uh, the book I was just telling you about, the Revelation of the of John the Apostle, uh, BYU New Testament, New Testament Commentary. Um, there's something here that I really liked. Okay. In fact, okay. The importance of... I wonder if I can... Can I zoom this in? Yeah, that works. Okay. Oh, no. Where'd it go? Book to be under... Okay, the extended allegory. Okay, the importance of understanding the book, the book is symbolic. Okay? This is something that I feel like a lot of people struggle with. And not of their own fault. Um, not everybody has all the time in the world to study these things and go in-depth. Um, and you can see how some things may seem like they're literal. But let, let's just see what the BYU uh, commentary about this is. Okay, the importance of understanding the book is symbolic. <clears throat> From chapter 1... But particularly from chapter 4 on, the Lord uses images as symbolic portrayals of a hidden reality. John lets the reader know from the, from the very first verse of his record, for he says that an angel came and signified the vision. The Greek word translated signify means to make known or authenticate via signs and tokens. <clears throat> okay? Symbols. Uh, the idea that God showed a prophet events that must come to pass and made them known via signs or symbols is found in, um, you know, I'm not good with my Roman numerals when it goes past a certain point, so I don't know what that is, but found in Daniel uh, chapter 2, verses 28 through 30 and 45. There, Daniel interprets the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, wherein he saw a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Daniel concluded his interpretation telling the king, quote, The great God has signified to the king what will occur in the latter days. End quote. Here we see that the king's dream was a pictorial rather than an abstract representation of what would be. Both the books of Daniel and Revelation use the word semino to underscore the precise nature of the communication that is one couched in symbols symbols and it, and it's interesting i've i've said this before but <clears throat> daniel the book of daniel and revelation are essentially companions to each other they they go hand in hand uh, they use a lot of the time some of the same imagery um okay so uh thus the word, uh, thus, the, the use of the word emphasizes that the images are to be taken symbolically and then translated so as to reveal their historical reality. This point is significant but, but, sorry, this point is significant because it underscores our treatment of the text. Quite a number of works on the book take the, the stance that since the text since the text clearly explains the meaning of some of the images, those it does not, must be taken literally. Okay, so you get that? So some people take the notion, they start reading the book of Revelation, and they're like, oh, okay, the first part here is explaining the symbols, but then there's other things here um, where it's not explained, so those must be literal. Okay. <clears throat> many of those who, many of those who take the visions literally see such depictions as those recorded in chapter 9 of a huge army of armored horsemen with their deadly steeds as descriptions of modern armies and weaponry. Though it is true that the last days will be filled with war, 
Taking these, these images too literally misses the point. For discussion, see notes and comments at chapter 9. Therefore, taking any of these images literally, based on John's own wor wording, would be wrong. Uh, just the opposite is true. The whole work is couched in symbolism, and to get at the message, one must see beyond these symbols to the important realities that lie behind them. Therefore, throughout this work, wherever there is a lack of clarity, uh, if an image should be understood literally or symbolically, we have always sided with the symbolic use. That being the case, we can detect four levels in which the story communicates with the reader. Quote, the linguistic level, which is composed of the record of the text itself to be read and heard. A visual level, which consists of John's actual visionary experience. The referential level, which consists of the particular historical identification of the objects seen in the vision, and the symbolic level, which consists of what the symbols in the vision connote um, about their historical reference. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Okay, <clears throat> this is how, this, in my opinion, is the right approach. Uh, whether it be beasts, or uh, whether it be numbers, or whether it be... Uh, just imagery that conjures up scenes from fantasy or sci-fi books, uh, that's wrong, in my opinion. And it looks like that's the opinion of BYU as well, or whoever uh, wrote this book. Um, so, I'm going to read some more. Uh, now, this is going to the BYU... Wait, no, where was it? Okay, this is from um, rsc.byu.edu, okay? This is called Understanding Images and Symbols in the Book of Revelation by Richard D. Draper. And I want to read this section right here, The Nature of apocaly Apocalyptic Style. The, re the reader must not go into Revelation expecting the logical and well-developed themes of most of the scriptures. Okay, so in other words, this is a different book. This is not like a a story. It's not it's not a it's not like the Book of Mormon where it's like telling a literal story. Um, this is not the same thing. Okay, the work is full of abrupt changes and impossible combinations. A completely logical and clearly understood apocalyptic style, however, would be contradiction in terms even for revelation. The reader must be prepared for a trip along a surreal and dreamlike, sometimes nightmare-like <laughs> landscape, uh, for sure. Uh, the prophet received his vision through um, poetic images, free of any need for external consistency and, and conform to reality. But this is what gives apocalyptic literature its impact. The style allows God to communicate through the force of the images and movements he creates. He is not shackled with the need to make, <clears throat> make all things smooth and logical. An inconsistency can even underscore a point. For example, the beast that rises from the sea in chapter 12 has seven heads, but ten horns and crowns. The Lord does not intend for the reader to arrange the horns on the heads, but to interpret them. Again, the heads represent represent Satan's kingdom on earth, symbolized by the seven hills of Rome. And the Joseph Smith translation states that the beast represent, represents kingdoms of the earth. The horns symbolize those powers, and the crowns those governments, uh, and the crowns those governments that are supported by the beast. The ten horns suggest that the beast's power, like the dragon's, is limited. This example shows how God uses symbols as a mean of communicating ideas. Symbols free John to represent transcendental and spiritual experiences. The Lord employs symbols in almost every sentence of the Revelation, but He did not re uh, He did not create them create them ex nihilo. Um, these symbols are consistent with the Old Testament and Jewish apocalyptic literature. Indeed, in Revelation, the Lord uses the words, phrases, images, and patterns of the ancient covenant as a kind of language arsenal that undergirded and propelled the message which John's contemporaries clearly understood. That's an important concept, that John's contemporaries, those 
of John's time uh, clearly understood what he was saying. Whereas us, modern day people, uh, pr most of my audience is, um, you know, we're Westerners, whether in the United States or, or even Western Europe, uh, you know, we're living in the year 2022 and we don't communicate this way anymore. We don't use symbols the same way. Uh, we're a different culture. We have a different language. Um, we have a completely different understanding of the world uh, because of when we live. So that has to be taken into account as we read this, okay? Um, not forgetting the fact that, oh, there's the daily siren. Sorry, everybody. Uh, every day at noon, that's when I'm recording this. Okay, let's continue. Important among the symbols used was the use of numbers. 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 You guys, with Jews, numbers are everything. We, we talked a little bit about um, Kabbalah, and before that there was Merkava mysticism, but even before that, uh, they've they've always been big into numbers, and rightly so, because uh, re numbers represent things. Numbers themselves are symbols of things, right? And um, so we, we have to keep that in mind, okay? Even though you and me, uh, we don't use numbers really to communicate in the way that they did, well, that's how they did. They, they had, living in a religious community, right? where everything is like homogenous, everyone's on the same page, it's a small world, it's not like a large world like it is now. Um, this made sense to them, this is how they communicated. Okay, one must be careful in taking them too literally, however. Near Eastern literature, not just Hebrew, reveals a fondness for using numbers to communicate ideas. When used this way, they take on a qualitative rather than quantitative meaning. So that means instead of actual numbers, like absolute numbers, they, these numbers represent certain qualities or ideas or deeper meanings, right? Uh, why certain numbers became laden with symbolic meaning is unknown. In most cases, the meanings arose during the period in which there was little or no record keeping and are now lost to us. It is of interest that there is a general consistency across cultures to the meaning of certain numbers, which John does not violate. For example, the numbers 4, 7, 12, and 1000 denote aspects of wholeness or completeness. The first, <clears throat> the first to the world, the second to totality of fullness. Okay, so... Okay, let me break this down. So four, because um, of the four corners of the world, or a square, usually a square is a symbol for the world. It has four sides. Okay, seven, of course, that's when, that, that was the completion of, um, of creation, right? Six days of work, seventh day of rest, that was the completion. Uh, Twelve, like he's saying here, the priesthood, and... The last, or a thousand, to superlative greatness or perfection. So, a thousand, you can think of it like, instead of like ten, because ten, we, we did another video talking about the significance of ten. Seven and ten kind of have like the same uh, connotation or the same, um, they both kind of represent completeness and perfection. Uh, I did a video be a little while ago, just, I don't know how long ago, but pretty recently, because, like, the number 17 has been coming up quite a bit, and I'm not going to go into all that here, but 17 is 7 plus 10, so if you're talking in a symbolic numerological language, it's like adding perfection to perfection, and you come up with a number that's comprised of two perfect numbers, uh, so to speak. You get, you get what I'm saying? So, anyway, um, okay, da, 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 da. some numbers express an identical idea. For example, oh, here we go with the, the tribulation period, right? For example, 1,260, 42, and three and a half are all derived from the Jewish calendar and denote the number of days and months 
in three and a half year in one half years. Okay, so you have three and a half years, you can just say it plainly like that, or you could say 42 months, or you could say 1,260 days, right? And we did a video specifically about this, about three and a half. Uh, go watch that video. I'll, I'll have to put all these videos down in, um, in the description because I think that these are very important concepts and th something that is lost on many people as they, a lot of, uh, you guys, Within the last couple years, there has been this idea introduced uh, into the membership of the church of a seven-year tribulation period. Before that time, it was basically unheard of. I, I had never heard of it before just a couple years ago. Um, there was a certain timeline that was proposed, uh, and it just took off, and now everybody is thinking like evangelicals and other Christian denominations, that there's a seven and a half year per period of tribulation. Now, we know that in the last days, there will be, and there currently is, tribulation, and they're talking about that in General Conference, but the idea that there's a seven year tribulation period, and there's a halfway point, and at the halfway point, that's when everybody gets translated, or after after the seven years or before the seven years, um, this, I'm telling you, this comes from um, and was appropriated from the evangelical world. This is where it comes from. I'm showing you all the different, the just these timelines where people are trying to take these numbers and they're trying to figure out when the second coming is going to be, right? Just timeline after timeline after timeline after timeline and guess what all of these do not match up <laughs> they do they do not some of them are wildly different from the others okay everyone has their own little take there's some people that believe that the rapture or our concept of being quickened and caught up when Christ comes. Some of them believe it's going to be before the seven-year tribulation period. Some of them believe it's going to be in the middle of the, of the tribulation period. Some of them think it's going to be after the tribulation period. But I would argue that the idea of a seven-year tribulation period is faulty and it's in error because they're taking these numbers from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, numbers that are meant to convey ideas rather than quantities or lengths of time. Okay, and the same applies to the 144,000. So that's why I'm bringing all this up. Okay, um, when we don't have that understanding that numbers w meant ideas to them, uh, then we come up with all these crazy things right here. Just crazy thing after 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 crazy thing. And this is only a small portion of what's out there. <laughs> this is, there is so there are so many of these out there. And they're just uh, people look put a lot of time into this. But from what we know of the Lord, okay, do you think that he expects us to go in and put together the puzzle pieces and put together a complicated timeline uh, so that we can figure out when he's going to come? I, I don't think so. He says to watch for the signs of the times, right? That when his coming is close, it'll be like summertime, how you know summer's approaching because you see certain things happening. Um, Joseph Smith, he actually, he, re well, he didn't rebuke uh, Father Miller, but there was a Millerite movement, and I, th I actually think that um, this timeline may actually be from, from that movement. Uh, anyway, they were doing this kind of stuff, and he had predicted a certain day when the second coming was going to happen, and Joseph Smith said, no, the scriptures do not give you the way to calculate when the second coming is going to happen. And yet, that's what so many people do. And people in our church, and, and again, I don't blame anybody. Everyone's like progressing at their own pace and trying to learn things. But I, I, re I really, really, based on Joseph Smith's statement uh, and based on schol the scholarly understanding of um, those days and how they communicated, uh, I think it's wrong. I, I don't think it's right. Um I'm not saying you're a bad person if you do, 
but I, I think that you need to take this into consideration. So, um, okay, so let's see that again. So, for example, 1,260, which, by the way, I've covered this before, but that comes from Revelation chapter 12, and the Joseph Smith translation changes it from days to years, and this is one of the main numbers that they use for the seven-year tribulation period. Uh, there's a wrench that gets thrown into that idea by the Joseph Smith translation. Because this represents apostasy, okay? That's what three and a half represents. It represents apostasy. It re he's about to say it right here. But that chapter is all about the apostasy <clears throat> that was going to happen after John the Revelator's time. How the woman was going to fl flee with the child, okay? Meaning that the church would leave with the kingdom of God and then come back after a period of years and years and years and years, not days, not three and a half, no, nothing close to three and a half years, but more like, you know, 1,260 years, more, more on that order. And even that I don't think is precise. I think it's just conveying the concept that, yeah, the woman is going to flee with the child for a long time, for a long, long time. So anyway, let me continue reading. For example, 1260, 42, and three and a half are all derived from the Jewish calendar and denote the number of days and months in three and one half years. Um, <clears throat> but they all represent the period in which God allows evil to dominate. You catch that? But they all represent the period in which God allows evil to dominate. So, in other words, times of apostasy, right? Or times when the church is really, really weak, uh, things like that. It is the temporary period in which the dragon and the beast rule. See Revelation, well, you can see it there. In this light, note that it is only after three and a half days of evil rejoicing over what appears to be a great victory <clears throat> that God's two witnesses to Israel are resurrected in good triumphs, uh, since the number two symbolizes witnesses, and three and one half the, the momentary triumph of evil, neither number need be taken literally. Hmm. Two, the two witnesses, and then uh, three and a half days. Okay, since the number two symbolizes witnesses, and three and one half the momentary triumph of evil, neither number need be taken literally. There may be more than two witnesses, and the period of their death may be more, more or less than three and one half days. God's point is that there will be a point when evil seems to have won, but that dream will be shattered the moment these prophets arise. The number of those called to service in the last days 1,444, or sorry, 1,400, oh my gosh, 144,000 is instructive. As noted, they are high priests called as missionaries in the last days. The message, however, is not in the quantity, okay, 144,000, for again, the number need not be taken literally, but in the quality. 12 represents priesthood. Multiplying the number by itself adds wholeness, as would multiplying it by 7. Thus, the number denotes the quality of priesthood held by those who are God's servants in the last days. For this reason, one need not worry that chapter 7 leaves out the tribe of Dan from the list. Okay, because <clears throat> that's the chapter where John is saying, okay, there's going to be 12,000 called from... Um, you know, Naphtali, there's going to be 12,000 called from Asher, 12,000 called from Judah, but Dan is left out, okay? And it says here, it's all symbolic. There will be many Danites in God's kingdom, but John may have left the tribe out because according to popular Jewish myth, the Antichrist was also, or was to arise from that tribe, and John worked to put out any form of idolatry. Okay, so with this in mind, as we're looking at this from a scholarly perspective of how the ancients worked and how they communicated, uh, with this better understanding, um, let's go back here to Zadok. And now it kind of makes sense, 
right? Kind of makes sense because <clears throat> this number seems to be referring to the priesthood in the last days, those who, who will be missionaries, those who work in the temple to bring people to the church of the firstborn, right? Temple workers, so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's look at this. This is from faith-based research and traditionalist philosophy, Richard, richardsonstudies.com. Uh, the 144,000 prophetic insight. I wanted to read a couple things from here. This is from, and we've read this before, I think at least a couple times. Um, okay, this is from Orson Pratt, Journal of Discourses, 1825. There are persons in this congregation who will be in the midst of Zion when the ten tribes come to Zion from the north countries. Okay, now Orson Pratt is famous for talking about the Ten Lost Tribes. Uh, there's a school of thought, and it's not accepted by everybody in the church, that <clears throat> there is a group of Israelites, the Ten Lost Tribes, that are hidden somewhere. Somewhere in the north. Most people will say something like the North Pole, or Siberia, or Alaska. Some people go as far as to say that there's like a, a inner earth, you know, like a hollow earth, or caverns, or that they advanced in technology, and then they uh, became a spacefaring people, right? Stuff like that. So let's look at, let's see, Orson Pratt. Let's find out when he lived. So he died in 1881, okay? So it's been quite a while. We're in 2022. Um, so he died 141 years ago, okay? And right here, he is saying that back then, um, 141 years ago or more, because I don't know how old he was when he said this, that there were going to be people in that congregation that would receive the ten tribes from the north. And he continues, and will assist in bestowing the blessings promised by the Almighty upon the heads of the tribes of Israel. There are servants of God in the midst of this congregation who will lay their hands upon many of each of these 12,000 chosen from the ten tribes and set them apart as missionaries to visit the nations of the earth and hunt up the remnants of the seed of Jacob. So from this statement, uh, now that it's been more than 141 years, we're going to have to decide, uh, you know, how we're going to view this, how we're going to view this statement. Uh, was it true? Did, did it actually happen, or was he wrong? Well, if it's true, if this is true, then it means that the tribes from the north did in fact come, and that this has happened. And you know what? I think that's true, because <clears throat> I do not believe that there's a main group of the Ten Lost Tribes hidden in the earth. Um, there's many that have pointed out that we, we've gone over Ensign articles, we've looked at Bruce R. McConkie, we looked at Brad Wilcox, we looked at um, a talk from, or yeah, a talk from uh, President Nelson when he was, Elder Nelson, when he was pointing out a scripture in Jeremiah that is used to say that there's a main body of hidden Ten Lost Tribes somewhere. We have multiple different things that show that they're simply, they mainly went up into Europe up through the Caucasus, and then into Europe. That's where the main body went, and then they became absorbed into the local populations. And an interesting that his, uh, another interesting thing that's been said lately, I watched both um, the European Area Devotional with uh, President Nelson, and then also we had um, kind of like a devotional or area conference with Elder Cook, uh, President Ballard, and Elder Holland. And in both cases, they both said to the congregation that <clears throat> the British Isles uh, in the one conference and then all of Europe in the other one, that these lands are rich in the blood of Israel, right? Um, <clears throat> now, I know, I know that there are those of you that are like, well, yeah, th there's more there, but there's a body somewhere. Well, then is, is Orson Pratt wrong? Okay, because he said that 
there would be people in that congregation that would uh, assist the ten tribes in receiving their blessings, right? Or is it more likely and logical that <clears throat> they have been lost as to their identity, they don't know who they are, just like Brad Wilcox says, that they forgot who they were, the rest of the world doesn't know who they are, but they're still here, but they've lost their identity. But they still have the blood of Israel, and um, they're began being gathered in. Prime in, the, in the early days of the church especially, they mostly came from those north countries, from Europe, especially Britain, the UK. So, anyway, so either... Um, and again, now he, now Orson Pratt, he's one that believed that there literally was a main body that was hidden somewhere. He has other quotes where he speculates on um, certain lands in the north. Uh, and, and I'll do that in another video sometime. Anyway, moving down here, it says, The prophet also said shortly before his death, uh, talking about Joseph Smith, I attended prayer meeting with the quorum in the assembly room, and made some remarks respecting the 144,000 mentioned by John the Revelator, showing that the selection of persons to form that number had already commenced. Had already commenced. Now, why are we talking about the Ten Lost Tribes and this at the same time? It's because people will say, well, we know that um, we're not close to the Second Coming uh, because the Ten Lost Tribes haven't been... Uh, haven't come back yet because what has to happen is the ten lost tribes have to come from their hiding place and then there has to be 12,000 selected from all the tribes okay so in other words what joseph smith is saying here and what uh, zadok is claiming here is that the selection process already began it began in the time of joseph smith but if we look at it from the scholarly point of view, and what the meaning of 144,000 is, which is 12 times 12 times 1,000, which is like, it's like saying priesthood times priesthood times greatness. You, you might as well translate it like that. Priesthood times priesthood times greatness. That, that's the concept that's being conveyed. That the priesthood in the last days is going to be incredible. And in, compare, in if you're looking at absolute numbers, Compared to ancient Israel, it is. It's incredible. And it fills the the whole earth. Whereas back in those days, it was limited to a very small geographic location. And the absolute numbers of Israel was smaller than the church today. Uh, at least I think that it was. Um, it is great. It, it, it's incredible. So, um, okay. Let me go back to where we were. So Joseph Smith is saying that that process already started. Orson Pratt said that people in that congregation, when he was giving this discourse, uh, would be the ones to give the tribes their blessings. Um, it seems like that's already taken place, although <clears throat> the understanding of who the tribes are uh, was not fully understood at that time. Um, later, it says, the four angels who are given power of the earth are kept from sending forth desolations upon the earth until God's servants are sealed in their foreheads. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that this sealing, quote, signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election made sure. Okay. Um, Okay, let's move on. Here, here is one of my other videos. I'll put this in, in the description below. Okay, now let's look at line upon line, precept upon precept, reflections on the 1877 commencement of the performance of endowments and sealings of the dead. Okay, the reason why I want to look at this is because it, it demonstrates that they didn't know everything back then uh, when the church first began. In the days of Orson Pratt, Joseph Smith, they, they understood the fundamentals. So what really mattered back then, they understood and they were doing what they were supposed to do. But the more kind of fringe topics or topics that are not so pertinent to then, um, they may not have had a full understanding of that. So that's why I think Orson Pratt did believe that there were a literal, there was a literal main group of the 10 lost tribes somewhere. So let's just read a little bit about this. This is talking about 
um, the salvation of the dead, bat baptisms for the dead, and I think that this will be a little this will be enlightening. Okay, so in other words, if this fundamental doctrine of doing baptisms for the dead and endowments wasn't clear in the beginning, then I'm pretty sure that the idea of the Ten Lost Tribes wasn't very clear either. Probably even less clear. So it says, um, a review of the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith indicates at least two truths about the understanding of the doctrine of salvation for the dead. First, that he spoke long and often and with great interest on the topic. And second, that his views and teachings on the subject progressed as new revelation was received. So he didn't know everything in the beginning. Uh, in, the, in the Angel Moroni's initial visit to the young Prophet Joseph in September 1823, he referred to the coming, the coming of Elijah, who would, quote, plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the, the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. Um, during the ensuing annual interviews uh, with, his, with his apprenticed prophet from 1824 to 1828, Moroni further gave Joseph Smith instruction and intelligence on what the Lord was going to do and how and in what manner his kingdom was to be conducted in the last days. In his Articles and Covenants of the Church, uh, presented at the Organization of the Church in April 1830, Joseph Smith indicated that the first principles and ordinances of the Gospel faith, repentance, baptism by immersion, and the gift of the Holy Ghost were necessary and available not only to those in this era, but also for, quote, all those from the beginning, even as many as were before before he, Christ, came, as well as those who, who came after. Precisely when the revelation came to the prophet Joseph, defining the, command, the commanding baptism for the dead, uh, it is not on record, but he first publicly taught the practice on August 15th, 1840. So, the church was organized in 1830, and we know that the first vision was in 1820. So, we don't have our first mention of doing baptisms for the dead all the way until 1840, 10 years after the church was established. So, basing much of his discourse on the 15th chapter of Corinthians, one month later, on September 13th or the 14th, 1840, uh, or from those two days, the 13th and the 14th, 1840, as his father l lay dying in Nauvoo, Joseph assured him that it was now possible for the saints to be baptized for the dead. Hearing this, his father asked Joseph to be baptized for Alvin immediately. On January 19th, 1841, the Lord instructed Joseph Smith further on the importance of building the temple. From this revelation, he learned that the ordinance of baptism for the dead had been quote, instituted from before the foundation of the world, end quote. Later, he taught that baptism for the dead was, quote, the only way that men can appear as saviors on Mount Zion, end quote. That sounds like uh, 144,000 talk. Okay, now let's go here. This was said more recently. This is from General Conference, uh, President Nelson's talk called The Temple in Your Spiritual Foundation. And this was... Uh, the October 2021 conference. He talks about here, now we're talking about the endowment, and it says, until his martyrdom, Joseph Smith continued to receive revelations that furthered the restoration of the endowment and sealing ordinances. He recognized, however, that further refinement was needed. After administering the endowment to Brigham Young in May 1842, Joseph told Brigham, quote, this is not arranged right. But we have done the best we could under the circumstances in which we are placed, and I wish you to take this matter in hand and organize and systematize all these ceremonies. So even the endowment itself, in the very beginning, uh, wasn't in its right form, or it wasn't in the right <clears throat> uh, organized whatever. It wasn't systematized. It, it, it was rough at the beginning, okay? So all I'm trying to say is that they didn't know. <laughs> you know, back then, uh, it probably seemed really clear to them that there was going to be 10 lost tribes that come from some unknown place, but that has changed. And, and you can see that, you can see that change, how the early, 
general authorities, some of them, and it wasn't really talked about too much, but some of them would talk about it, but then that changes within the last, like, century. Now they're not talking about that anymore, and they're actually saying the opposite. They're saying that, no, the ten, they went primarily to the north, the rest were scattered. But the main body went to the north and then became assimilated into the peoples of Europe, primarily. Okay, now, um, on the scripture citation index in regards to the 144,000, I just wanted to read something here. Uh, let's see. So, first, we have President Nelson. So, what I did is I, I went to DNC 7711, which is the section that taught, that is the question and answer session about, um, about the book of Revelation. And verse 11 is the one that talks about the 144,000. And so on the scripture citation index, you can see uh, who has cited these verses in their talks. So we have President Nelson, uh, at the time Elder Nelson, in uh, 2012, April conference. And he cites that verse about the 144,000. And this is how he uses it. We know that prophets of many dispensations, such as Adam, Noah, Moses, and Abraham, all taught of the divinity of our Heavenly Father and of Jesus Christ. Our present dispensation was introduced by Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ when they appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1820. The church was organized in 1830. Now, 182 years later, we remain under covenant to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then he... he cites a bunch of different scriptures, including the one about the 144,000. As we do so, both givers and receivers will be blessed. So, you don't really get the sense from his talk that he's talking about uh, 12,000 from every tribe to become super missionaries uh, while everyone is gathered at Zion because the whole world is at war uh, and then everybody else is just in a state of chaos and so they're the only ones that can go out and be safe while they perform their missions. No, he, he's using it in like the current tense uh, sense. So let's go to Joseph Smith and what he said. Okay, salvation for the dead. Wait, no. What footnote was that? 27. Yeah, okay. Salvation for the dead. There are mansions for those who obey a celestial law, and there are other mansions for those who come short of the law, every man in his own order. There is baptism for those who exercise... Sorry, there is baptism for those to exercise who are alive, and baptism for the dead who die without the knowledge of God. I am going on in my progress for eternal life. It is not only necessary that you should baptize for your dead, but you also have to go through all the ordinances for them, the same as you have gone through to save yourselves. There will be 144,000 saviors on Mount Zion, and with them an innumerable host that no man can number. Oh, I beseech you to go forward, go forward and make your calling and your election sure, and if any man preach any other gospel than that, which I have preached, he shall be cursed. And some of you who now hear um, me shall see it and know that I testify the truth concerning them. So he's talking about it in the sense of uh, doing temple work. <laughs> just plain and simple, just doing temple work. Doing the work for the dead and then by, by doing that becoming saviors on Mount Zion. So you can see from the scholarly research that ancient, uh, not even just, uh, you know, Israelites, Hebrews, but just the entire ancient Near East used numbers to communicate abstract ideas or concepts, right? Um, they weren't necessarily using the numbers as um, specific values, quantitative values. And that appears to be the case with the 144,000. It also appears to be the case with the dimensions of New Jerusalem, because there's some people that think that uh, New Jerusalem, you can't see, New Jerusalem, Earth. There's some people that think that New Jerusalem is literally going to be um, a continent-sized cube that's going to land on the Earth, because they don't understand symbolism. They don't understand that John is not talking about the absolute quantitative 
dimensions of the city, he's talking about its greatness and the priesthood that would be there, right? Here's just different pictures of, <laughs> of how, how big it would be. So it would cover up half of the United States. Um, it, it's just, you guys, let, let's, let's use our, let's use some common sense. Um, it's not going to be a gigantic cube, all right? Um, John is he's talking, using numbers uh, to convey ideas via symbolism. So uh, that's all that I have for this one. Um, I would advise you don't fall into this, what I call, I call this nonsense. I, I think it's maybe good attempts by people, but ultimately because they miss the mode of communication, you get these just insane looking <laughs> timelines <laughs> that uh, I don't think the Lord intended for us to be like, okay, now if you're wise, uh, you will be able to decode what I have put in the scriptures and you will know the time of my coming. No, <laughs> no. Okay. So that's it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you liked it, put your uh, thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share this with anyone that um, may be into this kind of thing, might be confused. Uh, not everybody's going to accept the message of this video, obviously. Some people are too, um, they spent maybe too long on these things and, and maybe there's uh, pride that is associated with it because they think that they have a really amazing um, idea of how things are going to play out. And so, uh, this could hurt pride or, you know, whatever, but just, just share it, share it with anyone that you think it might help and I'll talk to you guys later.